Welcome back to the Fantasy Formula. I'm Adam from F1 Fantasy HQ, and I'm joined as always by Rob from F1 Fantasy Hub. Rob, we had a week to recover between Australia and Japan, but there's still so much to talk about this week. Yeah, a lot of really fascinating outcomes from Australia. Thankfully, our team's turned it around, which we'll no doubt get into a little bit during the show and doesn't quite leave the same bad aftertaste like Vegemite that the first two races presented us with. But obviously very exciting to see a lot of teams do quite well. And as you pointed out, there's a lot of things we want to hit on throughout the show. So very much looking forward to that. Absolutely. Let's start as always by talking about the Fantasy Formula Live League. And it is up again over 100,000 teams. We've got a really exciting leaderboard to share with you this week. And in P1 is Fast BB. And this is a really interesting story. They played the 3x DRS boost in Bahrain, Limitless at Jeddah, and the no negative chip, which cleared 21 points of negative scoring lines last time out at Australia. So this is a person who went fast and furious with their chips. Yeah, again, we, we stress this every week, and a great result won't take anything away from the team Fast BB, but we, I definitely think that those who remain a little patient through the early stages of the season can probably make a few more considered choices with how they use their chips, um, and we've got a couple of sprint races coming up, uh, which I think we'll see a few people uh, deploy those. We'll hopefully put the more patient strategists in good stead uh, as we get into the thick of things throughout the season so congratulations to fast bb but we're very much on the hunt now that we've crept into the top 100,000. yeah and one of the drivers that's featured on a lot of these top teams this past week was yuki sonoda and that's a great segue to our fifth gear garms giveaway for this week and the question is are you running yuki sonoda at his home race this weekend at suzuka and remember to win this contest just head on over to the fantasy formulas base over on the fan amp app and answer this question we're going to pick a winner live this friday at our live show before qualifying for japan rob what do you think about yuki this week i think he has every you know uh, there's a lot of pressure and every expectation and um reason to be confident at his home grand prix uh i don't know necessarily what to expect because i think with every home grand grand prix a driver has there's an element of distraction with all of those off-track pr related activities uh, and we know how important this race is to Yuki. He's just come off his best drive of the season, and I'm sure he no doubt wants to build on that uh, into Japan. Whether or not that creates an unwanted distraction for him to, um, when he's trying to keep his mind on the job and stay ahead of Daniel Ricciardo is another thing altogether. So uh, in terms of the answer to the question for me, I don't know necessarily if I'm going to have the space for him in my team. I've I kind of got not much budget left uh, and a lot of my slots are likely locked in at the moment so probably no but i certainly wouldn't fault anyone for wanting to push for him this weekend what's your take on yuki so i'm of a similar mind but for a different reason so i had yuki on my team coming out of australia and for that reason a lot of my lineup spots are set for this week with yuki in the lineup i'm thinking i want to save a third transfer for china in the sprint race but we'll talk about that a little bit later in the show as for yuki i'm really starting to trust him even though he finished p12 and p13 in his last two races in japan he's clearly been the better of the two rbs like you mentioned a moment ago and he's been one of these safe budget drivers really since the middle of last season so i trust yuki this weekend and i'm really thrilled to have him and awasa running fp1 in their home race should be a really fun sight to see yeah, exciting for all of the local fans coming out to support their hometown heroes. So not that FP1 count, counts so much, but it will be great to see another Japanese driver in Iwasa on the track on the Friday. So very much a lot to look forward to uh, for the Japanese crowd this weekend. So continuing our stretch of Yuki Sonoda love, let's talk about the winners and losers from Australia. And I'll start with the man himself. So it was a huge P7 finish for RB. Yuki scored 11 fantasy points, which ranked 8th among all drivers. And this is important because Yuki hadn't finished higher than 8th since Imola 2022. And this marks the third straight race that he's outscored Danny Rick. So a really impressive result for Yuki, not only for his fantasy stock, but also as he prepares to hit the driver market. Really great week for him. Yeah, fantastic result for Yuki. He's definitely shown that he is on another level compared to Ricardo. I think a lot of people had the expectation he'd probably be just half a step off the pace, but he certainly put a lot of those doubters um, kind of in the background. And 
I think he can take a lot of confidence from that result in Australia. Won't take anything away from the fact that we did have three top drivers all not finish the race, but notwithstanding that, he's certainly made the most of his opportunities to secure valuable points for RB. So a lot of people have been handsomely rewarded, yourself included, in Australia, and I certainly expect his stocks increasing heading into his home Grand Prix. He was also the beneficiary of that late Alonzo penalty, but we can debate that another day. Rob, who was your first winner? I had Carlos Sainz, and that should come as a surprise to nobody whatsoever. Carlos had his best result of the season, uh, a win for Ferrari, and honestly, the ca- capped out the, the one-two for the Scuderia. So a fantastic weekend across the board. He finished with 46 points, and his second driver of the day nomination in two races uh, he has finished this year. Um And it it just is a a great sign for that second Ferrari seat, if we can call it that, that as you pointed out a number of times, that record so far this season is 100% uh, for driver of the day nominations. He continues also his streak as the only non-Red Bull driver to win a Grand Prix since George Russell in Brazil 2022. So fantastic momentum for him, particularly bouncing back after that appendicitis uh, and Certainly, even though he is third in the fantasy driver standings, having only been in two races, certainly deserves serious consideration for our DRS- DRSB uh, for Japan. How did you think he raced in Australia? Oh, he was tremendous. And you had mentioned he scored 46 points, which is the most by a driver this season, but it's also the most fantasy points by a Ferrari driver since Carlos at Monza in 2022. It was that good. And it makes for really interesting on-track scenarios, too, because this is the first time since 2010 the top three drivers in the Drivers' Championship have been separated by five or fewer points. The top three back in 2010 was Massa, Vettel, and Alonso. So really good stuff, both in the fantasy game and in the driver's standings, too. What about your second winner? I think we probably continue the theme of uh, the red of Ferrari. So listen, I keep saying Ferrari in this space, but there's still a third of teams that are still running RB. So I'm going to keep giving you new reasons to bring in Ferrari alongside Red Bull until more people start listening. They scored 92 points to lead all constructors last week. Like you mentioned a moment ago, they took home fastest lap. Um, This time it was Charles. It was the second time in three races that they took home fastest lap. They also scored more points for the fastest pit stop. This is the second time in three races they've done that. And they also brought in a million-dollar price increase. So all good reasons to start getting into Ferrari. And with this price climbing up, time is running out to bring them onto your team. So I recommend you all do it right away. Yeah, certainly. I think they've solidified, if not before the race, uh, their position as the second-best constructor uh, in F1 and in F1 Fantasy. And that 95-point performance uh, is certainly... A 92-point performance, I should say, is certainly indicative of their fantasy potential, uh, much like Yuki Sonoda taking advantage of those spots available in the midfield to clinch points. Uh, they did very much the same with Max, George and Lewis all not getting to the end of the race. So a fantastic result for them. Their highest, uh, not just their highest fantasy result of the season, the constructor, but the highest single race score among all constructors through three races. So a lot of optimism for the Scuderia heading into Japan. Rob, let's talk about your second winner because he was high on my list too. Yeah, Lance Stroll was exceptional, I thought, in Australia. He turned in his best driver of the season, came away with 16 fantasy points. And I think he is one driver that's representative of exceptional fantasy value. He's had two price increases of $1 million in Australia and half a million in Bahrain, uh, obviously looking past his DNF in Saudi Arabia, which hurt quite a few of us but he is in my opinion a c-tier asset and we'll get into the pricing um, structure algorithm uh, and all of that good stuff that's recently come to mind um, in the f1 fantasy community but i i call stroll a c-tier fantasy asset with b-tier fantasy production uh, assuming he can get to the end of the race and we know he comes with a degree of risk with some of that dnf history um, and a checkered qualifying performance too but from what we've seen when he's kept it on the track, a pretty good start to his season as well. And for Lance, this is the highest fantasy total on a non-sprint weekend for him since Spain last season, and he did it in a really impressive way. This isn't one of those cases where a backmarker was out in Q1 and got all those points through overtakes. He qualified in the top 10, 
outlasted a few unlucky DNFs ahead of him and finished in the top 10. He ended up taking home P6 after the Alonzo penalty. So it was a really impressive and steady run for Lance from start to finish. I think it's a good sign of things to come for him too. He really deserved the big price boost. Definitely. A lot of a lot of uh, happy outcomes for, for fantasy strategists that have owned these assets. But if we flip the coin and take a look at our losers, who's your first one for Australia? I want to say this loud and clear because I might never get to say it again. The biggest loser from Australia was Max Verstappen. So Max has taken pole 35 times and has only failed to convert six of them, and this was one time. So it's a very, very rare situation that we see, so we've really got to revel in it. He finished with negative 10 points, but the biggest loss of all was that he dropped 0.7 million in value. And since F1 took over the game in 2023, that's the largest loss we've ever seen of a single asset in the game. And we're going to see a little bit later in the show, he's not going to gain that back in a single week either. So it's a huge hit for strategists running Max. What do you think of his performance? Yeah, look, I think he did up until his retirement on lap three, everything we'd come to expect from Max. He is the consummate professional and always seems to deliver on Saturday and Sunday. A very rare we see an outcome like this for him, but I'm sure he's going to turn it around um, at Japan. A pretty solid result there he's had the last couple of years. So I have every expectation he's going to bounce back from this disappointing performance uh, or disappointing result, I should probably say. Uh, but like you say, uh, an optimal time uh, the next couple of weeks to bring him back into our teams, given he is at um, a very low uh, price compared to where he usually is uh, and I think we're going to see a lot of people who were fortunate enough to diverge from him like you and I in Australia and uh, with the sprints coming up where he tends to do quite well we might see him back in our fantasy lineup sooner than expected yeah it makes me really glad we made the move we did had we stayed with RB and Max things could have been much worse for us this past week Rob I see over in your losers you have one of our usual winners tell us a bit about Joe yeah, unfortunately, Joe, I think it's well documented that we will not issue that uh, Sauber have been plagued with through the first three races of this season. It is unfortunate because both Joe and Valtteri, I think you can kind of, it's very much a cookie cutter kind of response or answer I'll give to uh, why I've got him in the losers column. But it is you know, the wheel nut, which is their own undoing. Their pit stops have been diabolical, to say the least. I wouldn't be surprised if they're still in the Australian pit lane at the moment. But quite frankly, it has been the cause for them not scoring points. They've been in the box seat on a number of occasions through all three races to score points for Sauber. And it just has been this complicated wheel nut, which doesn't seem like it's going to be resolved before we get to Europe. So... I do have some skepticism about running these guys for the next few races. Uh, and quite interestingly, uh, Joe, who is known in fantasy circles as a bit of an overtake merchant, uh, had his first race without an overtake since Canada of last year. So we haven't seen that for some time and uh, was quite surprised to see that when I uh, checked his uh, points at the end of Australia. You know, I was going to say something similar. He has six overtakes total through three races this season. He scored more than seven overtakes in a single race seven times last year. So it's he's definitely off to a tough start, and I think those pit stop woes are really leading to some issues with him and Valtteri getting those overtakes, and that's where a lot of their values generated. So a really tough start yeah. for show. My second loser this week is Alex Albon, and we probably know his story at this point. Alex crashed in FP1. And since the team couldn't recover the chassis, they didn't carry a spare, he piloted Logan's car, and that made for a really tough story all the way around. First off, this is a bad look for Alex because he rode off a car in this exact same turn, turn seven, last year too. So he's got to be more careful in this turn. It led to a huge disaster for his team. And then he needed to take that leap of faith from Williams and turn it into points, but he only missed it by one spot. But he really let the team down on this. And it was very interesting to see how Albon failed to conquer the Haas cars. This is the second race in a row. Albon went up to Hulkenberg to try to pass him. Hulk closed the door. And then when Magnussen wanted to pass Albon, he leapt right past him. There was really no fight. So clearly the Haas is ahead of Williams at this point, which is a scary thing to think. Meanwhile, from a fantasy standpoint, he only scored four points. He lost 0.1 million in price. And this just isn't what we're used to from Alex. There was a 12-race stretch last season <clears throat> where in 11 of those 12 races, he scored eight or more points. He's only got 10 points on the whole season to start. So we really need more from Alex to justify his price. Yeah, definitely. I think you made a, a good point around the Haas boys that have taken quite 
a good stride forward in terms of race pace and overall performance and they are emerging as strong alternatives to a reliable asset like Alex Albon at the moment. Hulkenberg's priced the same at 7.2 million uh, and certainly becomes a more attractive option because of their race craft, their experience and the fact that they're also going to be able to put themselves in what seems to be more point scoring opportunities compared to the Williams, which maybe has taken a little bit of a step back. To be fair, it did need a bit of time to warm up last year, and maybe that's a few races away before we see Alex turn the corner, but right now hasn't really delivered what we probably expected through three races, despite the fact he is still one of the highest owned assets in the game. Rob, your second loser is going to break my heart, but go ahead. I won't harp on about Mercedes too long, Adam, but it, it was probably their worst weekend in recent memory for the Silver Arrows. Double DNF, Lewis out within 10 laps, George that crash um, that ultimately ended the race uh, on a safety car and minus 17 points uh, across the weekend for the constructor was the worst fantasy score among all constructors this season. So not a great weekend at all for Mercedes. Uh, certainly puts them well down the pecking order. They're fifth overall in the fantasy standings. I don't think there's value at all there for them. They're about one point per million dollars spent, which at 19.8 for a constructor is just not value at all. When you've got the likes of Ferrari, McLaren, and even Aston Martin, as I pointed out, you could even say Haas as well are offering much better fantasy production and and value too. So I think they may need, as the team has said on a number of occasions, a little bit more time to improve that car performance. But for me, it's just not, Um, sunshine and rainbows over in their garage at the moment and across the board drivers and constructors a strong avoid for the time being it was a sad day for us mercedes fans for sure was the first double dnf for this team since 2018 so it's a rare thing to happen and this is the saddest fact if you look at the constructor standings mercedes are closer to alpine than they are to mclaren that's how bad things have gotten. So we need to come back from this double DNF this week. Hopefully the guys can put up a better result in Japan. It can't be much worse than a double DNF though, can it? If I'm not mistaken, was it the German Grand Prix that they had that last double DNF in 2018? I feel like maybe, I can't remember, but it, it, has, it has been some time. And it, it, I it's, blacked uh, it out of my mind. Yeah, I was going to say, let's not try and uh, keep revisiting that anytime soon. But yeah, not, not a great weekend for the Silver Arrows. Let's move on to our hit list because we've got a fully loaded lineup on the hit list tonight. And we're going to start with the game-changing news about the price change algorithm. So week in and week out, the game makes these changes to all of the drivers and constructors' prices, and we don't know for sure how those are made. And our friends at F1 Fantasy Tools have done their darndest to make a tool that will predict it as best they can. But now finally, a member of their Discord, a guy by the name of Max Live, he figured out how to predict what these price changes will be so let's go through a quick example here so well we'll start from the top with this this chart the drivers are broken down into three price tiers tier a is just the expensive stuff max and red bull tier b are your drivers and constructors that typically finish in the top 10 your ferrari mclaren mercedes and checo and then tier c are typically what we'd call budget drivers and then each week they calculate the normalized points ratio, which is the number of points scored by a driver divided by the average number of points scored by all drivers that week. So then you line up the normalized points ratio with what tier the asset is in, and you get their price change. So let's use the example of Ferrari in Australia. They scored 92 points. The average constructor in Australia scored 26 points. So the normalized points ratio is 3.46. If you Look at this chart on the bottom, greater than three with a tier B asset, that's a $1 million price change. And so now this really allows strategists like Rob and I to give you better advice long-term on which assets are going to grow and help make changes two and three weeks out. I'm very excited. Yeah, it's really given us uh, a much better insight, as you pointed out, into how prices change week to week. And I know I probably had a little bit of a spoiler alert earlier in the video where I inferred that Stroll was a, a C tier asset with B tier fantasy production. I think that's really given us a much better idea as to what drivers are offering the most value and how that fantasy production on a consistent basis can tie into those sustained price increases week to week. Uh, we've got a couple of example assets on the screen that uh, are clearly 
shown as what tier they sit in. And I think to me, Adam, there's a couple of drivers and constructors that stand out as more value for money than others uh, from what we've seen through three races. What's really neat about this is it makes it clear to me that your tier A assets are going to rake in the points, but they're not going to be budget enablers. Whereas your tier C drivers and constructors, that's where you're going to start really gaining value. So over the course of the season, we're going to have to figure out, do I prioritize points? Do I prioritize cost cap gain? Or do I try to ride it somewhere in the middle? And I think you'll see with some of our predictions for Japan this week, which way Rob and I are going. Yeah, it's a, it's a very important time for our fantasy teams just because of the fact we've got a couple of big weekends coming up after the J Japan, a lot of decisions that need to be strategically thought about. And, you know, with this big revelation around the opportunity to chase price gains and improve our team value to afford more optimal lineups, what that means uh, and how we can structure our teams heading into sprint weekends where points are going to be fast uh, and f flowing fast and um, on the table for many drivers and constructors. So definitely an opportunity to really take advantage of that and move ahead in the global ranks. Rob, let's talk about our favorite tier A driver, Max Verstappen. So he lost 0.7 million in Australia last week. A lot of people were wondering, is this the last week I can afford Max? Is he going to gain 0.7 million in value? And is Max a must start this week? Based on what we just saw with that price gain estimator, what do you think about Max going forward? It's a tough one because we spoke very highly of him through the first two races of the season. Then as the, the meta lineup, the template lineup emerged that uh, a constructor heavy team of Red Bull and Ferrari uh, was popular in producing fantasy pr points uh, week in, week out, that Max was one of the make ways for a lot of our teams. It seems as though as budget has increased progressively through the first three races though, that some people have the option to move to a Max Verstappen, Red Bull and Ferrari constructor. However, that obviously leaves um, the teams that can afford that with what I like to call the cheese and lettuce, the scraps that kind of sit in the driver classes. As you can see here, Valtteri Bottas, Logan Sargent, Joe, some of the cheapest drivers floating around at the moment and they all come with their own risks. So it really is a, a game of cat and mouse with whether or not you want to go for points, whether or not you want to park the bus for a little bit, build a little bit more team value and then reconsider an option or a lineup like this once we get to China and Miami. And, you know, you and I have been wise to advise people this week. You and I don't have a budget that can afford Max, Red Bull, and Ferrari. So we're mm -hmm. just saying what we would do in some of these cases. But to me, I think it depends, like I said a moment ago, are you prioritizing points or cost cap gain? If you're prioritizing points, just Max, Red Bull, Ferrari alone have averaged 183 points these last three weeks. And that includes the Max ENF hitting two assets last week, both the driver and the constructor. Now... On the flip side, we know that Max is going to gain at most 0.2 million in value, so he's not going to be a budget enabler, whereas if you run an alternative like you and I ran Leclerc with Lance Stroll last week, that's going to have a much higher budget upside. So maybe some teams want to roll with that lineup, build that budget, and then you'll have a stronger Max lineup going into the sprint weekend in China. Yeah, certainly, and I think Max is going to be a very popular option at a sprint race weekend like China, like Miami, the kind of driver to me that is going to consistently be around P1, P2 in both sessions. Um, reliability permitting, of course, which I don't think we'll see too many more concerns of for the time being. But uh, I think for another week, there's absolutely no harm in going for a team that's going to hopefully build a bit more budget and then you can spread those funds out a little bit more easily um, once we get to those sprints and avoid the risks that come with running a, a double Sauber lineup and Logan Sargent too, which um, in my opinion scares me a little bit and I'm kind of glad to be quite honest with you, Adam. I don't have the budget or ha and have to make a decision like that because I'm quite happy with how my team performed in Australia. So Rob, if bringing Verstappen in your team means running double Sauber, let's talk about the perils of running double Sauber. Now I'm running the, the Kick Sauber fifth gear Garm shirt. I love the shirt, but I'm hating the pit stops. So I've, all the stats I've read about Sauber's pit stops this year have been disturbing. They've done 11 pit stops this year, totaling 158 seconds. You don't have to be a math genius to know that averages to a terrible stop time. Of those 11 pit stops, only one of those has been under three seconds, which is a standard in F1 right now. They're clearly missing the mark, and it's some sort of mechanical issue with either the material of the nut or how 
the, the team is removing it and putting it back on because it keeps cross-threading. They keep carrying spares. They're rolling into the pit lane. Everything's been a mess. Yeah, it, it's not a great look for the Sauber team that for both drivers which are out of contract next year are in a car that obviously can't seem to translate some of the race pace that I thought they looked like they had through the first couple races of the year. As you can see on the screen, that's also holding them back um, and being able to make inroads into further up the field. Uh, it doesn't seem, as I think I said earlier, a concern or an issue that's going to be rectified in the next race or two. It, it may take at least three to four more races from what the team's saying to see it a, a solution addressed. Uh, and that may be by the time we get to Monaco, for instance, which is you know a little ways down the road. So it is a bit of a difficult situation, and particularly if you're deciding to go with the Max Verstappen Red Bull Ferrari lineup, as we were just talking about, uh, something you're going to just have to accept and come to terms with that that's going to obviously hold your team back to a certain extent um, until that's addressed by the team. This graph you see on the screen is what makes this so frustrating is that Valtteri was running with the 10th fastest mean lap time in this race, but because his bad pit stop was earlier in the race, he was relegated to the back of the grid and he just couldn't do any of that good work for overtakes to make up the points. And of those bad pit stops, there were four that were more than 20 seconds this year. And listen to these fantasy outputs. Batas in Bahrain, zero points. Joe at Jeddah, negative two. Batas in Australia, two. Joe in Australia, four. So when these bad pit stops happen, it really diminishes the upside of these fantasy assets. I think with me stuck with Valtteri on my team, I don't have a whole lot of flexibility to go outside of him unless I want to go to Logan Sargent, who may or may not even have a car by the time the race happens. So I may have to roll the dice with Valtteri and Sauber's wheel nuts. I think I'm very much the same. I don't, much like you, have many options in that budget price bracket. Uh, so unless I do pivot to a Bottas or a Sergeant, which either seems like a sideways trade or a, a complete downgrade in terms of Sergeant, uh, I'm probably, again, going to have to hold station for another week. And I'm not willing to, for the time being, take... Um, you know, make two trades or even take a minus 10 on a weekend that probably won't bear the same fruit that we'll see in China and Miami. So it could just be um, <laughs> standing pat for the time being and just having to bite the bullet. So while the top half of our team has a lot of points upside, a lot of cost cap gain upside, the bottom of our team has these liabilities. You have Batas and Joe with the wheel nut issue, and then you have Alex Aban and the Williams with not having enough chassis to go by for the weekend. This is going to be a big topic for Terry on our live show. How much can Williams get done by this weekend? What are some of the risks of running Williams assets this week? It looks like they're going to bring at least two cars so both drivers can compete. But the third chassis is looking unlikely for this week, Rob. Yeah, and it is a big problem for, for Williams. Uh, Vals has stressed that on a number of occasions. It's just not good enough. But unfortunately, like you've said, it's, it's going to be even if Sargent and Albon uh, do participate, which it looks like they will, uh, a weekend that they're going to have, tre have to tread very carefully with. Uh, if either of them have an incident with the car in practice and qualifying, it essentially ruins their Sunday. Uh, and given Logan's history at this track and Albon's history at this track over the last couple of seasons, it's not a good omen for the, for the Williams outfit. No, double DNF from this team last year. It was two separate incidents, and the Logan DNF was particularly ugly. He just punched another driver in front of him. He couldn't quite make the overtake. Albon's the only driver on the grid to DNF the last two Japanese Grand Prix. So it's going to be really important for both drivers to stay on the track and just survive to China. Hope that third chassis will be there to bail them out if things go awry. Yeah, and I think for a lot of people that are running a Sauber driver and Alex Albon, which I'd say is not all that uncommon at the moment, it may well be we see quite a few people have to hold at least one of these two drivers heading into Japan just because of the fact that a lot of people will consider rolling a, a third trade into uh, China. So it, it could be just one of those weeks where you have to you know, hold station, just deal with whatever the outcome is and then obviously use the extra trade flexibility we have in the following race to bin one or both of them off if you decide to kind of just hold and not <laughs> not take too much action for the time being. I'm going to have plenty of heartburn this weekend because not only does Albon have a DNF history at this track, there's also rain in the forecast for this weekend. Mm. And it's our first wet weather weekend of the season. 
we saw this race was shortened by rain two years ago. It was actually called by a curfew before the race went the full distance. And that was a pretty tame Japanese Grand Prix. There weren't a lot of overtakes, weren't a lot of DNFs. It was just a, a parade route before the, the rain cut the race short. Last year, there were several DNFs in a dry race. I think it's going to be a mixed bag this year. Yeah, it is uh, certainly a challenging circuit, in my opinion. I think that Sector 1 with the S's can certainly undo even some of the more competent drivers on the on the grid. And with rain in the mix, uh, it certainly opens the door for no negative. I know a lot of people use it in Australia because of the history of DNFs there. You've just talked about the Williams history with the DNFs the last couple of seasons throw rain into the mix at a circuit that is certainly by no means an easy one on the calendar and we could see a few few crashes across the weekend don't get me wrong rain is exciting for a number of reasons but i don't think that necessarily means we could have one of the more predictable weekends on our hands for fantasy production so rob on that same vein a, a lot of folks have been asking us is the weekend to use no negative right in front of us with japan i'm not sure it's time to use no negative yet i'm still staking my flag in this thought that the second half of the season you're going to have cars breaking down just because engines are getting uh, older it's getting hotter out we have some trickier tracks later in the calendar so i think i'm going to save my no negative for later in the season what about you? yeah yeah I, I agree with you i also think now that the chip has been reworked to address each scoring category rather than the aggregate for a driver score over the weekend. Sprint races also comes into the conversation because there's an extra session of risk available for drivers to make mistakes or lose positions or whatever it is that attracts minus points. So, you know, you combine that with um, your point around later in the season and we've got a bucket of <laughs> sprint races in the second half. Uh, we've got Qatar, Brazil, Circuit of the Americas, uh, all tracks that had... Uh, different degrees of incidents last year and I certainly expect we could see something similar this time around so I think consider all of those factors and it might just be one of those wet weekends where we have to hide behind the sofa and hope for our team to emerge unscathed. Rob the fan ant pick of the week question is what compound of tire does the winner finish on and last year I think the popular strategies it was a two-stop race it was hard, soft, hard, or soft. I think it was soft, hard, hard. So I'm going to go with they're going to finish on hard tires, and somebody else in the top five is going to pit late for softs and steal fastest lap. What about oh, you? Bold strategy. That's on the proviso. There's no rain, of course, because yes. we're not going to see too many people running the uh, the slicks if it's, uh, if it's a wet race. But I think... Um, for the sake of being different, with 75% chance of rain on the Sunday, I think we could well end up on an intermediate compound. If it's not too wet, we could see a very wet track, but not one whereby it's completely um, soaked. So I think for that, you know, it could be a dry start to the day, a little bit of rain in the afternoon, whatever it might be. I'm going to say the Inters. I like it. Let's see how it plays out. So we're going to wrap up tonight with a very special segment. Every week, I share the standings of the F1 Live Presenters League. And this is where all your favorite F1 TV personalities are competing for fantasy glory. And I just share some of the movement up and down in the standings. And this week, I got a very interesting reply from Will Buxton, who said, I need all the help I can get. Well, Will, we're here for you. Let's talk about your lineup and figure out how we can get you back in the fight with plenty of season left to unfold. Yeah, I think first things first with Will's team, he's got all the foundations of a team that can succeed don't get me wrong i think max had a very bad weekend and that was only exacerbated by the fact that will obviously had the 2x drs boost on verstappen not also helped too much by the double dnf with mercedes i think you also look at some drivers like joe holkenberg albon and i know we've talked about the shortcomings of joe and albon before but i definitely think those drivers are certainly ones that are not absolute drops uh this week and then look at the ferrari constructor adam you've been very high on them um so a lot of good things to consider uh first and foremost i want to pull on a thread of something you said rob i think it's so important to have two strong constructors particularly red bull and ferrari because there are two special bonuses they get that drivers don't the first is sending both drivers into q3 
Red Bull have done it in all three races this season. Ferrari did it in two races with Behrman just missing Q3 in his debut. And then the other bonus is fastest pit stops. Of the 54 points on offer this season for fastest pit stop, these two constructors have won 49 of them. So they're getting us a lot of points in very special ways. And I think it's a great differentiator for teams like Will because some of the other teams that are in that half of the standings, particularly JSC, Katie Osborne, and James Hinchcliffe, they all have Mercedes. So if he moves out of Mercedes and gets himself into Red Bull, it'll be a differentiator and something that I think would be a huge points boost for him. Yeah, 100%. I think Mercedes have demonstrated that on their day, they're a very reliable constructor, but when you're looking at Ferrari, which is still points per million wise, the best value constructor from what we've seen so far, and Red Bull, as you pointed out, with Max in the team, there's a couple of different options we could consider for potentially swapping out the Mercedes constructor and Max in favor of some other alternatives, which are proving to be quite reliable fantasy wise this season. And for anybody who hasn't seen them yet, I recommend either Checo, Charles, or Carlos as those budget enablers to allow you to fit in Red Bull. It's hard to say goodbye to Max. This is a race that he's won two times in a row, but I think the constructors will make it worth your while. And those two Ferrari drivers are really on a tear lately. So I think that's a great way to get your team back up to the top. Yeah, and absolutely not taking away, again, anything from Will's team. It's got the makings of a team that you and I have similarly run uh throughout this season at various points the only glaring or interesting selection i can see is esteban ocon now i think alpine's performance has been talked about a little a little bit throughout this season and i think fantasy wise they're not necessarily the worst pickup but ocon in particular just seems to have middling results and in a car which does struggle for race pace uh, there is probably some other options out there that are worth considering at the moment aren't there I think for me, if I had this lineup and I only had two free transfers for the week, I would probably be okay leaving Esteban in just to move the constructor and Max out rather than moving Ocon to and taking the 10-point penalty. But I can see what you say, Rob. Like It's it's definitely an interesting time to own an Alpine asset because they could really mm. be hit or miss. Yeah, so I think what we've reached is uh, Red Bull constructor in for Mercedes and then a science-type driver in for the DRS boost. So, Will, if you're seeing this, reach out. We're here to help you any week you need us. We're happy to get you back on track, and thank you for the call out. We're always here to help. So, Rob, that's our show for tonight. We'll be back this Friday with an all-new Fantasy Formula live show at 5 p.m. Eastern, and this is the same time we ran it in Australia, but for those of you that went through Daylight Savings Time this past weekend, it'll be one hour later for you, so make sure to set your alarms for it. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you on Friday.